why are we sending more foster care children to prison rather than college? The average cost of incarcerating someone for a year is $35,000. Compare that with the average income a college graduate earns, and that's $50,000. For those foster care youth who age out, one in four will be involved in the justice system within two years. The more placements the child has, the more likelihood that child is of incarceration. Fewer than 10% of teenagers age, who uh, are in foster care uh, attempt college. Of those, fewer than 3% graduate by the age of 25. The cost to society is enormous, but the cost to the individual child is immeasurable. The ripple effect of this failure is felt for generations. Foster care kids are far too often overlooked by society or when they are seen, they are viewed with distrust. I was around nine years old when my friend sitting next to me in class said that his mom was thinking of adopting a child out of foster care. He looked at me and said, I hope she doesn't. You never know what they'll grow up to look like. This sentiment was repeated off and on throughout my entire life. I remember sitting with a large group of friends after work. We were grunting through our first significant jobs right out of college. Eventually, the conversation turned to kids and whether or not we would have any. I said I wanted to adopt a child out of foster care, and the woman sitting across from me said, oh, I would never do that. And I asked her why, and she said, there's something fundamentally wrong with a child whose own parents would reject them. I said, do you feel this about all foster care kids? When she said yes, I mustered a smile, I stuck out my hand and I said, hi, my name is Sabrina and I was adopted out of foster care. <laughs> she was shocked and she immediately got up, grabbed her boyfriend and headed for the door. That was the end of our friendship. Our society often views foster care kids as lost causes or worse. We view them in similar, uh, those aging out in similar ways that we view those age, uh, getting paroled out of prison. One thing is easily forgotten. They are, in fact, children. They are worthy and deserving of love, and they are in foster care through no fault of their own. Today, no one associates me with severe domestic violence and neglect that I survived as a child. Few know that I spent years in foster care, moving frequently from placement to placement. As an academic librarian with a near 20-year marriage and three beautiful children, my life bears little resemblance to its chaotic start. I survived both the trauma of child abuse and the additional trauma of years in foster care. Eventually, and fortunately, I was adopted. But my achievements have enabled me to mask what I have endured and to listen in on people's honest feelings uh, about what they view as the potential of foster care children. This is why I know we need to rethink what is possible for foster care children, particularly those who are aging out. Changing the future of foster care children requires us to become a trauma-informed community. Numerous studies of foster care teenagers point that 75 to 80% of them want to go to college. That's the same amount of teenagers who have never been in care. So why is there such a disparity between the goals of these children and the obtainment of those goals? As a librarian, I am drawn to answer difficult questions. For the past several years, I've really dug into the research of childhood trauma and resiliency. Much of this research has been deeply personal for me. Because I was adopted, I am in a unique position to see what chances I was afforded, particularly to build resiliency. I have insight to see how resiliency can be built through relationships, whether one is adopted out or not. Building bridges to resiliency through relationship is part of becoming a trauma-informed community. This community reshapes how we think about what is possible for foster care children, both consciously and subconsciously. We must understand that resiliency can be built up within people. It is not static. 
Resiliency is the ability to adapt well or bounce back in the presence of difficult life events. You may be familiar with ACE scores. That's the Adverse Childhood Experiences questionnaire that tallies the different types of abuse and neglect, which place you at a higher risk for health problems and substance abuse, even mental health disorders. As you may have guessed, I have very high ACE scores. But did you know that there is also a resiliency score too? Like the ACEs questionnaire, this survey measures what combination of factors contributes to resiliency. Research demonstrates that the primary factor to resilience is having caring and supportive relationships, both within and outside the family. Relationships that create love and trust and provide role models that offer encouragement and reassurance. I also have a very high resiliency score. This research is reflected in my life. I think back to the people who lifted me up and put me on a different path. It is because of the support I received in those relationships that I began to heal. I think back to Ben and Leah Renfro, a kind elderly couple in my church who demonstrated what unconditional love looked like on a day-to-day -day basis by simply allowing me to interact with them. Their lives were filled with kindness. It was nothing extraordinary, but their friendship helped heal me and guide me uh, just by including me in their lives. I think back to my junior high English teacher, Miss Vicki Jewell. Miss Vicki Jewell went out of her way to rewrite the narrative in my head that I was not smart enough or good enough to amount to very much. I was not good or gifted in school. Because of the trauma I experienced, I have difficulty remembering things and memorizing. Miss Vicki Jewell, she saw me struggle. She saw my work ethic. She was relentless in her pursuit to rebuild my broken self-esteem. There are many others throughout the years, years who healed my trauma in bits and pieces, drips and drops, just by simply building a connection and fostering a relationship with me. It haunts me to this day to know that I very well could have aged out. Lacking in financial resources and emotional support, I know that the statistics of poverty, homelessness, and crime, that could have been my fate too. Foster care children are so often invisible. They are moved from placement to placement, which in turn limits their ability to learn in a stable school environment. Changing schools doesn't just disrupt their education, although it does do that. It disrupts their relationships with their peers and teachers who are able, who are able to help them and guide them. Imagine you are a teenager aging out of the foster care system. Through Herculean efforts, you gather your required transcripts from each of the different placements and different schools you've attended. You pay for your college admittance testing and admission fees all on your own. You are admitted only to face the university gauntlet of tuition, financial aid, additional fees, signing up for classes, meeting your advisor, choosing a major, all without additional support no support to rely on, why is there such a disparity between those teenagers who go to college and, and those who graduate? I think we can see. So how can we send more foster care kids to college, retain them, and eventually usher them to graduation? Our first thoughts are financial, and yes, there are state and federal funds to help those aging out of foster care attend college. However, this is a patchwork of resources, and it differs from state to state. Also, it is unmarketed to those who need it the most. The assumption is that these kids already get plenty of financial help. Well, this is only partially true, and only for those kids that know about it. Housing is our second greatest concern because it is critical to success. Often, these dorm rooms are the first stable, independent living experiences that these teenagers have encountered. But unlike their peers, when winter and summer breaks roll around and students move back to their homes, these students, these students don't have a home to go back to. Without options, where do we point them? The city mission? 
I believe we can do better than that. I believe that year around housing is possible if we make it into a priority. Becoming a trauma-informed community means pulling together cross-sectional departments working together collaboratively. Imagine resident life and financial aid working together to help these students, weaving together a support system for them for that cost of housing and the cost of higher education in general. Fortunately, there are examples of bridge programs that retain and accelerate graduation rates of those formerly served foster youth on campus. Fostering success from Western Michigan University is one strong example. This program noted that financial and housing support alone was not adequate to meet the needs of these students. Supportive relationships, peer mentoring, coach, coaching, and trauma-informed gui guidance are necessary for student success. This university provides academic assistance in the form of freshman seminars to meet their unique needs, mentorship in the form of trauma-informed coaching, focus on partnership, goal setting, maximizing motivation, and potential. Coaches help close the exposure gap that foster care kids experience because of missed opportunities or life skills that most of us take for granted. Examples of these exposure gaps include grocery shopping, visiting a bank, dressing up for a special occasion, and getting ready for interviews. These aren't remedial steps, but rather missing skills and insight that they just haven't experienced yet. These coaches help to close these gaps. Due to these support services and building of resiliency at Western Michigan University, retention and graduation rates have increased. These bridge programs create trauma-informed communities where collaborative departments work together combining education about trauma, resilience, treatment, and support. Rethinking what is possible for foster care children means fundamentally changing our support services for them. We need to think of them as we do our own children. They don't just need housing and financial help, but direct guidance and mentoring. When we fail them, we fail ourselves, we fail our society. I encourage you each of you to reach out to your community programs that are already in place today. In addition to your financial support, offer them your hearts and hands. Offer to mentor, offer to build the relationships that instill the, relationship, the re resiliency and fill the exposure gaps. Not all of us can be foster parents, but we can be a person outside the system who cares and is willing to guide. If you are like me and spent time in foster care, I want to encourage you to open up about your experiences, force society to rethink what is possible for foster care kids. They need to see our successes. They need to see what is possible. It is essential for the kids in foster care ki cared now to see us and see what their potential could be. For those of you in foster care now, I want you to know that you are not limited by the trauma from your past. Your potential is limitless. Do not buy into the lie that you are not worthy of higher education, a sense of family, and a sense of home and belonging you are. You are worthy of love and belonging just as you are. Your history doesn't define you. It doesn't define your potential, and it will not define your destiny. Your choices do that. If you are aging out soon, I want you to know that universities tend to be full of people who want to see you succeed. I'd love to see you on campus. I want you to know that you already have one friend. Thank you. <laughs>